So, yeah, I, uh, I'm Alexi and I work for Fault Partner and basically I've been working on multimedia frameworks for quite a while. Um, integrating codecs, performance optimization, power optimization, integrating device drivers and stuff. So, that's my contact. So, uh, there would be, if there are questions which I'm not able to answer, we could talk later. So, this is the flow that I'm planning for the whole presentation. So, if uh, the, the initial few sections are more of introduction kind of a thing. I'd like to spend more time with the tweaking, optimizing the hardware acceleration or the codec integration if that's of interest. Streaming if that's of interest. So how I'd like to do it is uh, if you have some questions in between, I can, I'm ready to take it up. I have a total of 45 minutes. So I can like speak for 30 minutes and then take up uh, quiz for 10 minutes. Otherwise, if you want to be having quiz, uh, quiz in between, I'm fine with that. So. Yeah, so multimedia frameworks. So what it's supposed to be doing is it's supposed to take care of uh, making sure you have the best experience for your multimedia playback, your camera recording, your 3D playback, 3D recording, or uh, stuff like that. But why is it supposed to be doing is because uh, when Boxy was launched, one of the biggest things they said was you don't care about what the three letters after the dot is. Basically, it's really difficult to do that. There are enough codec formats, there are enough file formats, there are umpteen audio formats, there are different types of uh, latency requirements, so your video conferencing might require like very hard latency requirements. So there are a lot of variations possible. So how, how can one single framework take care of that? And StageFright tries to do it, but it, it does a okay job, but there are lots of ways we can potentially go for improving it. So that's why I said like, I'd like to talk about the tweaks, the performance improvements we can do inside StageFight. So moving ahead, so StageFight is the primary multimedia framework that's there now. What was there earlier was, you know, it was open code, and then they moved into StageFight. But there's also this talk about an OpenMax AL coming up. So not, how many of you are familiar with OpenMax? Yeah, OpenMax is a set of stand, uh, API standards from uh, in the industry consortium called Kronos. So uh, AL is something like uh, equivalent to your player record APIs. So uh, Google is trying to see if they can have, that's what I've heard. So Google is trying to see if they can have an AL for performance critical applications on Android moving ahead. So still being discussed. But uh, considering the problems that we have seen with Stage 5 for like coming up with very high performance applications. Say, say uh, the person here was talking about, can we do something for voice synthesis? So <coughs> for voice synthesis, one of the biggest requirements is, or like song synthesis. So one of, one of the biggest requirements for that is an extremely low latency uh, audio pipeline. So which is something like what Pulse Audio does. But uh, if you add an audio flicker on top of it, and then you add a stage thread on top of it, that's not the kind of latency you get. Or, you go for a say 50 millisecond video conferencing end to end uh, latency requirement, you can't do it with the kind of framework that StageFright provides. But that's where the custom frameworks might come into picture, or if OpenMax AL could be uh, a right way to go ahead. Depends on how it actually <coughs> pans out. So for the feature set, there is support for multiple file formats, it integrates OpenMax codecs, and also like each of the Silicon vendors are, are, are looking at integrating their codecs into the stage fight so that they can have accelerated multimedia playback. So we work a lot with uh, DI. We work a lot with DI and integrating the codecs and optimizing the codecs and stuff. So on map for a lot of the codecs are from us. So the OpenMax components are also from us. So we basically look at accelerating the stage fight, accelerating the media playback as such, and also recording with the stage fight component. Next thing is the recording. So recording, you also have like say regular recording, camera recording, and then you have your 3D recording coming in, your multi-view coding. Say, there is a whole lot of things which are uh, coming in up. Then there is streaming to it. So streaming is, currently there's full support for RTSP playback. So the, the record path is coming in. Uh, and then you have HTTP streaming. So if you, most of your MP3 songs, that uh, your radio, the station that you see. It will be either over RTSP or it will be at times over HTTP. Okay, so this is the block diagram that a lot of you would have seen. It's huge, it's scary, so we'll keep referring back to this. 
So I would like to talk about some of them, uh, some of the blocks. So these are the main components that are in, in this book. Like how I do it is, uh, I'll, I'll just give you an overview of the blocks and then I'll actually come uh, come back and say like what what is it we did for Skype. So we have a Skype solution and I, I'll talk about how we went ahead and customized uh, say Skype to actually achieve that. So if that's of interest to you or if you have, uh, if you have specific questions we can, we can take that. So the data source is yeah the source of every flow in the pipe. Even though I refer to it again and again as pipes, it's not exactly a pipe in the multimedia framework in the way. So if you've seen GStream or Direct Show or any of the multimedia, if you have like dealt with uh, multimedia frameworks, till date everything was a proper pipe. Like you have a source node from where the data flows onto the sink, uh, the next node, and then there is other nodes. But in stage sprite, there are more, more of function calls which are called by the uh, level one, one level below. So the uh, say uh, the Graph Builder would take care of the awesome player or stage sprite recorder. Would take each of these modules and then connect them together. And then the, the, down, the downstream guy would call the read of the upstream guy and that's how the data flows down. So data source is this, uh, all the source elements like MPECO data source or any of those take care, uh, is derived from data source. And this is where you actually put in your sniffers. Sniffers are file format recognizers. So if you want to add there's support for MKB now, there's support for uh, ABI, there's support for MP4. So if you want to add support for say WMV, you'll be looking at the data, data source. So you'll add a sniffer, there is a, a register sniffer function you can call. So you'll add a sniffer, get the mic type and see that okay, once the file is this particular type and then you see this particular mic type in it or this particular header in it, okay this is my, my type of file and then that's how the rest of the pipe would recognize that yes, this is a particular file type. Then you have media extractors which actually take care of extracting and reading the data out. Because each of the file formats would have its own specifics about how is that data is stored. Say ABI, just a blob of data, data that's there. So if you have MP4, you have more track specific things. You have multiple tracks, you have audio video tracks, and then you have inside video, you can have uh, multiple, multiple, multiple video tracks itself. So the extractor is what understands the format. So, uh, and then you have the media source. Media source again is any component which actually acts as a source for any of the downstream components is a media source. So your OMX codec, which is actually integrating your codecs, your encoders and decoders is also a media source. Because from, with respect to the uh, writer or the renderer, if we had a proper renderer in place, then that would have, that'd be a media source, right? Because it's actually generating media and then passing it on. So uh, the media source, is uh, that. And then we have the media buffer which is what actually carries the data around. So that's the data structure you'll be looking at uh, for the data part. Why this media buffer and metadata and all, all that is important is when you want to tweak the framework, you'll have to understand the structure very well. So the metadata is what is used for generally your, uh, your timestamps, your, your configuration information. So why we dealt with it was when uh, when Skype was being done. So we had to write a node which would take care of taking data from Skype and then passing it on to your decoder pipeline. So the metadata has to be passed from the stream and then the, uh, because it's s 6 expert so you have a codex specific configuration. How many of you have background with codex and uh, multiplayer frameworks? Okay. So. <laughs> so uh, my basic question. So essentially, uh, uh, Maybe I didn't read the, the description properly, but is this a, um, you know, a lecture for uh, writing a new codec or you know, optimizing a codec or is it you know, using them? Okay, it's actually not any of them. Because <laughs> writing a new codec is gone, that's my the, our com whole company's job. Yeah. So uh, optimizing it again is very platform specific. So codecs are out of the picture here. Uh, integrating a new component could be, but it's mostly about giving an overview of space time because if people had more, I could get into details, but there are like hardly five people with background in multimedia frameworks and codings. So it's almost impossible with that kind of a background to get in there. What I can try doing is I, I could move back, I could do a bit more intro level kind of a thing rather than trying to get into details. So if you want to talk about details, we can do that later. But I, I think I should stick to the, the basics part. So if, is that okay? Stage fright is like a paid framework for I mean, I I'm sorry? Stage fright is the paid framework. <coughs> paid. 
paid. Yeah, is it a paid framework or is it a framework which is open for all? It's open for all. You can download. Uh, it's part of the Android system. So, like the modifications each of the companies make, everyone has its own their own variant of uh, the framework. So, if you look at the TI branch of uh, Android, which is there in my video, it's uh, they are changes are there. So they have they are actually making a lot of changes for adding 3D support and a lot of codec support is coming in. So that's there, adding support for like <coughs> new sleepers. So do you want me to get uh, talk more about the components and like how the how what this picture is about? Do you think that would help? Yes. Don't look at all the blocks. Okay, just look at say let's just talk about uh, the source node. Okay, let's just talk about the source. Let's we'll start with the source. So, how do you start re uh, reading a file? So, from the like, uh, how many of you are application uh, guys, UI guys? Okay. So, how many of you use multimedia in your applications? Okay. okay. So then, let's talk about from the usage perspective. So, from a user, one of the problems that we see is uh, there's a team in our company who was trying to write an internet radio application. So, the thing is, it's actually pretty straightforward to write an internet radio application. The UI is pretty straightforward. Again, there are APIs to give you like 10,000 radio stations. But then the issue is about 9,500 odd stations not playing. Why? Because from the, the app guys, it's the, the parsing code for uh, you send a uh, request, you get a response, you parse it, you build a list. Beautiful, you have 10,000 stations <coughs> with you, but 9,500 of them doesn't play. So that's when you'd have to understand, even if you're an application guy, you would still have to understand what is it that happens underneath. So that's why this whole RTSP and HTTP and all the codec formats comes into the file containers, the file formats, or that is relevant for you. So let's talk from that perspective. So if you take a, a streaming format, so you get an HTTP link, you might, uh, you'd say, you would expect that it would directly play, right? Because say it's by has support for HTTP. Yes, but the thing is HTTP, will give you some data. So if it's an MP3, yeah, assuming your uh, stage fright variant that's there on the phone that you have has support for that particular MP3. So if it's a VBR, which is variable bitrate, the coding might not support it. So you ha you have to get into like, what is the data type that's coming out of the uh, data stream? So how do you go about doing it? So generally when you get to the SVP link, so the easiest way to do it is paste it in your browser on the PC and then get the data and then analyze the data. So you have a tool called Wireshark, which is extremely useful. Wireshark. Wire, W-I-R-E, Shark. So it was, it was called Ethereal. So now it's called Wireshark. So that's, that's an extremely useful tool to analyze what type of data comes in. So what we saw was some of the stations were actually in HTTP, uh, but the content that was coming in was AAC. So AAC is advanced audio coding. coding. Uh, so um, the platforms that they were trying it on did not have the ASA coding. So that's why it wasn't playing fine. So, it moved, uh, so that gave us some more stations. And then moved there to the rest of it. So there's RTSP. So that's the next type of streaming format that you, you might encounter. So RTSP streaming, that's uh, one of the things I would like to get into, but again, that's digging into RTSP streaming as well. So I'll explain what basically RTSP streaming is. RTSP streaming is like, say if you make a phone call, you first, there is this, uh, you dial a number, right? you dial a number and then you find. So the backend takes care of finding out where the other person is and then ringing it. So that part is the call, the call signaling part. So people from the, the, the SIP background will easily relate to it. The SIP takes care of initiating the call. So RTSP is something like that. RTSP takes care of initiating the media session. So if you look at, when you go to YouTube, you have uh, a small tab which says 240p, 360p or 480p and stuff, or 720p. So when you say SMPTP, people generally move to HD. So the same stream is stored in different formats, in, in different resolutions. So depending on your capability or your interest, so if you have a lower end phone, you might not want to play, you might want to see the video, but not at the maybe the, the fullest quality possible. If you're streaming over GPRs, you'd be happy if you could get some data here, right? <laughs> so if you are on 3G or maybe if you are at home and if you are on Wi-Fi, you would be, you would want a better quality video. So, how is it that the server gets to know that what is the capability of the client? So the client basically has a negotiation session that happens. So that's what this RTSP does. So RTSP gives a, so uh, again, coming back to the internet data example, we get an RTSP link. 
we give it to the uh, media player. And as, as an app guy, you expect it to play. It doesn't play. What happens? So the RTSP uh, that's there in uh, Stagefright, what it tries to do is, it tries to send a, uh, a, a, a request to the server. The server comes back with, okay, these are the formats that I support. I support X format in these resolutions, Y format in these resolutions. And then the player has to decide, okay, yeah, which is the best of it. The app doesn't even come to know the media framework takes care of it. So uh, the media framework has to decide, okay, based on my load right now, maybe I might be able to do a, a 1080p or a 720p or a lower resolution. So that part is again taken care of by RTSP. And then the RTP part comes in, which is actually the data flow. So the data flow is taken care of by this protocol. This is like an associated protocol of RTSP called RTP. Again, there are variants, a lot of variants to it. So Microsoft has gone ahead and implemented their extensions. Other people have. So that's why RTSP, even though the link might say RTSP, and even though you might, when you look at the specification of stage fright, yes, RTSP is supported. And you expect the links to play. No, it doesn't play. Because again, the RTSP might be contained, might have a lot of uh, codecs which are not supported by the platform. So that's why you would, when you write an application, when you use uh, uh, streaming, when you use file playback, you have to understand what type of files are there, what, what are the different type of streaming formats that are there, what is the dependency between the format, the codec, and so. So, I'll give you one more part about what is this codec file format and stuff. So, if you look at an MP4 file, is it a codec or a file format or a yeah, so it's a file format, it's a container, right? It's like, it's a file, it's a .mp4 file. But an mp3, is it a file format or a codec? It's both. Because mp3 can be a .mp3 itself. So .mp3 is a file format and a codec. But mp3 can also go inside mp4, an mp4 file, right? So that's why it's a codec and a file format. Your JPEG, is it a codec or a file format? Yeah, so you get the hint. So there are things which can expire itself. So your WMV is actually a codec, there's a codec called WMV and there's also a file format which is kind of WMV. So, sorry? That's ASF, not Yeah, but there are files, that's technically ASF, but some some people actually just rename the ASF file as WMV, so. There's an extension you could call it the Yeah, technically yes. But if you look at, if you download a, a content, you'll see a .WMV file. It's Technically an ASF file, it's purely technically speaking it's an ASF file, but people would say, okay, this is a WMV file, it has only video, no. <coughs> so it's, you're from here, right? So, yeah, so, uh, let's move on. We'll, uh, I'll, I'll talk about uh, uh, the features of uh, the playback part. So the file playback is that, <coughs> have HTTP and RTSP, whatever I'm talking about, file playback is basically, playing back from, you give a file and it plays back. So you have a local file, so you play back from that. So uh, why I mentioned this time queue and the AV sync part is, AV sync is audio video sync. So how do you make sure that a recorded video will have the audio playing together? So what is the mechanism inside SageFright which handles that? So uh, how it does this is, basically there is this queue that is there. So uh, in the, Awesome player part. So, let's come back to the <coughs> block diagram. So you have the red, uh, um, am I going too fast or is it something of interest or should we go into something else? Okay. I mean, from an application point of view, that would be interesting. Probably, I think the level here is bigger. I guess so. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. No, first time you know that you yeah, uh, I can take that question up because uh, I would like to cover some portions of uh, SageFight because since it was supposed to be a SageFight talk, so let's at least cover some portions. Come on, I put some effort into it, sir. So. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. I'll definitely talk about talking about that because that's one of the applications my wife uses a lot. She sings to it. So uh, it's really interesting in the way people come up with multimedia applications. So there was a question there. No, I just wanted to add to it if we can. You can spend a few minutes on the use case of what you did with the Skype implementation. Okay. Then that would Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get there. And when I'll get there at the end where sure. I summarize the performance optimization, the latency part, and everything. So that's when I will actually, that's, that'll be a capsule. Is it covers the integration for the I want to increase the component, the faster or the Okay, no, I won't be able to talk about it, but we can definitely talk. 
we have, we have done it so we can yeah, yeah but we should be the Sorry? Yeah, but the problem is there are like hardly five people with coding background. So if I start talking about it, yeah. Uh, I have one question on the HTTP. The yeah. Which you put in your slide. I mean, Google says that HTTP live streaming is available only from ice cream sandwich. Right? So what do you mean by that? Yeah, actually, there is some with some push of this uh, code in Gingerbread. But so the phone doesn't support it. Right? Yeah, it could be depending on. Like I'm not sure uh, which phone are you talking about. No gingerbread phones. Okay. Yeah, but in the code there is support for HTTP. You actually referring to the same Apple protocol HTTP live stream? No, I'm talking about. This. See, if you give an HTTP link and then uh, I, I give HTTP colon slash slash and then a file name, right? At the end of it there'll be a file. So kind of like a progressive download thing. So not the live stream. No. Yeah, officially yeah, it's only coming up in ice cream sandwich, but there are. So usually how uh, the Android uh, thing works is the first time around, when Stage was introduced, there was only a playback path. But then records got added later. But in, even in the first one, there was a like kind of uh, experimental variant of it and stuff. People I could keep see adding uh, a shortcut name being played in the... HTTP <coughs> Live and Gingerbread and... HTTP Live still a different form. Yeah. Uh, there is, there is some support uh, there. Yeah, there's uh, like a preliminary support for it. So this is saying it's actually progressive down. Yeah. So why this? Uh, I, I would like to talk about a bit more about AV Sync. So AV Sync, say, I'll talk about what AV Sync is. So you have a file and there are video samples and there are audio samples. So you know that both of it are stored separately. So video is stored separately from audio. So how is that you can correlate a particular video sample with an audio sample? So for that, the basic thing that you have is a timestamp. But then the thing is, your audio pipe is very different from the video pipe. Your decoding goes on uh, from through a different piece of hardware, while your audio might be mostly software coding. So even if there are hardware coding, it's a different pipe again. So finally, when we are rendering it, someone has to make sure that the samples that I'm playing back on the screen is the same thing as somewhat, or somewhere on the same reason as the audio. It should not be like too slow or too fast, right? So one of the things is you have to rate limit it. Because audio coding, uh, decoding might be faster. So you should make sure that the audio playback is still happening at the same speed as what was recorded, right? So if you are recording at 8,000 samples a second, you should be still be playing back at 8,000 samples a second. If you are playing back music, you might be at 40, 48 kilohertz, and you should still be playing at 48, 48,000 kilohertz. So similarly, uh, the uh, for video, when you have video coming at 30 frames per second, how is that correlated? So what happens is in the renderer part, the final component which takes care of putting things onto the screen, the renderer has a skew that is there. So it's it's kind of like having a, a timer. And the time is actually updated from the audio side. So whenever the audio is played, the time gets updated. And the and this is used as a clock for the video. So the, the video looks at the time and sees that, okay, 15 samples have played. And then I should be at this particular sample, and if it's not, then it goes for a sleep. It basically schedules itself again after that much time, and then it comes and renders. So that's the basic logic that's there. The audio is the master. So audio, based on how much audio has been played, you go ahead and uh, update the clock, and then the video looks at the clock and then sees what to do. If it's too late, it drops the sample and then moves on to the next sample. So why is it that we generally keep audio as a master? Because uh, audio, uh, uh, slight jerks in the audio you can actually perceive. So generally that's how, that's why audio is kept as a master. So, so shouldn't it be the other way around then? I mean, if you are saying that uh, slight jerks, is, jerks in audio is like acceptable. No, it's perceivable. It's not acceptable, that's what it is. Oh, perceivable, okay. It's perceivable. So you should, you keep audio playing irrespective of what, what, whatever happens. You keep audio playing and then you drop, you drop or you sleep for a while for a video to catch up or if video is too fast, you sleep for a while. And uh, my second follow-up question is like, let's say if you're actually doing this, right? Uh, generally the one which gets processed faster, uh, that should be the one which should be uh, which should be sleeping, right? Because the other one is taking more time. Ideally, yes. But if you try to do or you're sleeping in audio, you can actually notice it. The problem is perception. Because video, you can't perceive if, even if I drop like five frames and give it to you. For a second, you might, you might be able to perceive like five frames, but if, I, if I'm doing it cleanly, like if I do uh, drop two here and then two later, you might not be able to perceive. So. so that means it's actually like getting magnified, right? One is you're dropping uh, 
you may be dropping a couple of video frames because the processing is slower and second thing is you may be dropping a couple of more frames to actually make sure that your video is in sync with the audio so exactly it's the same thing the same thing say when you are playing back flash on your laptop like flash is a bad boy right so everyone tries to play flash and look how slow flash playback is so when you when you play back a high resolution flash video on your laptop if you if uh, you try it on a network you can actually see this you can see that the video is is terribly slow like it's painstakingly slow it just doesn't move it's just like <coughs> i'm moving like a, a slow motion stuff right so basically what's happening is a lot of frames being dropped so that's what finally happens it's it's a, it's, a, it's one of whatever you said is one of the same so basically you drop video and it's not that with, just because you drop video you drop more no that doesn't happen you drop video and hope to catch up at some point in time so assume that your video processing say your pro process speed is 600 megahertz okay and assuming that you have 500 megahertz for video but for the resolution that you have if your pro if you need 1000 megahertz that means that you can do only 15 fps right Fifteen frames in a second. So, thousand megahertz is required for thirty frames. Then, five hundred megahertz you can do fifteen frames. <coughs> Whatever you do, you can do fifteen frames. So, you have to drop the rest of it, and you can't drop before the decoder because of issues with the coding. It would be ideal if you could drop it before the decoder because you could save on the processing and then move on. But you can't do that because video generally has a dependency with the previous frames and frame rate. Why this slide? Okay. Uh, so, generally, this is what. Would be looked into when we actually talk about integrating a coding. So, uh, StageFlight as such works on integrates OpenAI codecs. So, this is the flow that will be there. Why again this is required is say when you are integrating a custom codec, when you are trying to integrate a new uh, file format or a new streaming format or something, and then your decoding is not happening fine, you have to dig into OpenAI OMX codecs source code because uh, this is the flow that will happen. Your empty buffer down here. Empty this buffer and fill, fill buffer down and fill this buffer. So this is the flow that will be there. So basically, codecs are given input buffers through uh, depending on what type of codec it is. So assume it's your encoder. So encoder's input buffer would be given through an empty this buffer call, and the encoder's output buffer will be given through a fill this buffer call. And then when it's done encoding, the encoder will give back a fill buffer done, and the input buffer would be freed through an em uh, empty buffer. So that's the sequence. So, what and awesome player actually through the OMX code. <coughs> OMX code is the wrapper over the whole OMX uh, way that's there below. So, through uh, through the read function, the awesome player takes the buffer out. So, if it's video, uh, after the read, you get the data and then you render it. Yep. So, let's talk a bit about this. Let's just talk about the codec configuration because one of the things when you have to talk uh, when you look at a codec integration is uh, the way your codec understands a particular codec uh, it might be different from the way it comes in. Say so that's one of the problems we have with Skype. The way the PC gives you the file, uh, the frames are a bit different from the way the platform uh, codecs were giving us. The PC was giving the first frame as a smaller frame, which is just a header, and then the data separately. While the rest of the data, uh, while the platform was giving the whole frame with the header and the frame as one single frame, <coughs> so you the codec config you have to understand how is it that uh, the platform takes care of the codec on the platform takes care of parsing this codec configuration information. So when you're integrating a codec or when you're integrating uh, when you're trying to use a codec, if it's failing, you would have to understand what is the type. What is the way in which it takes the uh, the, uh, the the header? Because usually, the header parsing is one of the things where you might mess up. The way you're giving the header to the codec might be different from the way it's expecting it. So try to understand, go through the codec specification or the documentation that's there. Try to see the way it's already integrated. So if from the MPEG4, the MPEG4 extractor is a good place to look at because that would they would since they would have integrated with the MPEG4 extractor, you can see how is it that he is using the coding configuration which is passed from there. So, do we have any questions here? So, uh, <coughs> one, one question. Um, maybe <coughs> think is uh, if there's an audio present, uh, uh, you can do a thing, can, you know, uh, you just explain that. Yeah. Uh, now, if there's no audio. If there's no what? audio. 
Yeah, it's easy, right? If there's no audio person, you just play it along the timestamp. So your timestamps will be proper, assuming your timestamps are proper. If your timestamps are not proper, that's when you don't land in trouble. So if your timestamps are proper, what you'll be doing is you just take, look at the timestamps and see when is it that each of the frames should be played. So you have a presentation timestamp, which is basically your time at which your video should be played. That's it. When, uh, so uh, for example, the, the use case that I'm talking about is a surveillance application where you get only the audio but not the uh, video along. Okay. So basically the driver is also to be written, uh, or at least the modification of the driver is to be written and uh, uh, you know the, the analysis and the uh, playout part is also to be written. Uh, so now when would it occur that you know the timestamp are not proper? In the you said only audio, right? Mm -hmm. only, only video. Only video, sorry. Uh, Okay, the timestamps might be a problem if uh, if your capture side itself is timestamping it wrongly, right? That's when the timestamps will go for a dust. Right, but so is there a way to uh, ensure that the timestamp goes wrong? No, there's nothing you can do. What you can do is like if you say if you there are other problems you have, you have an issue with clock drifts and stuff. Yeah. So there are protocols for like trying to synchronize that and stuff. So that's outside the purview of uh, whatever that's there in stage five. But when you're implementing an application like this, you'll have to worry about clock drifts. You'll have to worry about because the way you have 15, you might you might say that your clock is actually a, uh, you would say that you would want a clock tick every once in 33 millisecond, and your system will tell you that yes, I'm giving you 33 millisecond. But what 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 could be happening is the system might be giving it 40 milliseconds. What can you do for that? Right? So the, these are the practical problems you'll face. Because you might still be assuming that your system is running fine, but does it? So the record pipe, do you want to get into this or should we take up more quizzes? Okay. Uh, uh, you talked about ADC during the playback. Yeah. So what about recording? Okay, recording is slightly simpler <coughs> because you just, as long as you put the correct timestamps, it's okay. So each of the frame, say for, uh, uh, we'll talk about the recorder. So the camera source actually is the one that gives uh, takes data from the camera hand and then gives to the rest of the pipe. So the camera shows when it there's a uh, there's a timestamp callback. So it basically timestamps it with the media buffer. There will be a timestamp associated with it. So and uh, that timestamp is what is used by the encoder and that timestamp is what is used while writing it. So the time is taken care of by that. So do you draw samples if there's a mismatch between the media and what if what happens? If yeah, if video encoding takes long time, right? We don't have to take care of it. Automatic buffering inside the pipe will take care of it. So assume you have uh, your encoder, your camera is capturing 30 frames per second, okay? but your camera is doing 1080p, but your system is not able to do that kind of resolution. So what will happen is, even though your camera is capturing at 30 frames, since your encoder is happening at say 15 frames, it will drop automatically drop down to the lowest. Uh, no, it will somewhere close to the input. Because you can't be faster than the slowest guy in the pipe. So it will automatically drop down to the slowest guy in the pipe. And why that happens is because the buffering internally, so the and camera needs some buffer into which it can write data, right? So the camera basically, since, it, since the encoder is still crossing the earlier, earlier buffers, the camera after a while it will st uh, start starving. So when, uh, and then the camera will automatically drop down to 15 frames. So after the initial slight jerk, the camera will automatically come down to 15 frames. That's the behavior. This five thing, you have audio and video separate in chips or it's in sequence? It's a separate, it's a separate box. Yeah. How is that running RTSP as such as it has a control for forward and... Yeah. No, actually it depends. It depends on the way you would like to implement. Because fast forward in video is slightly more complicated because you have to have the previous frames also, right? If you are look, say to look at quick time, you can actually go back a frame by frame. If you are to do that, you will have to decode every single frame. So there's a huge component coming up for RTSP, but I don't think we will get there. So yeah. So. Uh, yeah, so another thing is uh, with respect to the record pipe is how do you make sure that you can actually have a zero copy? So, StageFlight allows for quirks. So
So quirks are variations that are required by the camera and the input. So SageFed actually tells you that, okay, if you don't want a mem copy and if you don't want a particular port to allocate uh, memory for it, you can take care of, uh, you, you, you can tell the encoder that, okay, there's not going to be any uh, memory. Your uh, buffers are going to come from the camera. So you have to make sure that you use, you basically look at any extensions like this, which is possible in your platform, because doing a mem copy for a camera type of a data is huge. Because if you're doing 1080p and if you're doing mem copy at 30 frames per second, you're looking at about 40 megabytes. So, which is just going to kill your uh, system, your power up, power uh, consumption is going to go up, your bandwidth, <coughs> your memory interface uh, is going to be hogged. So basically you're doing the wrong thing if you're uh, doing a mem copy. The hardware coding integration, I think we can skip this. Uh, I think we'll have to skip the RTSP streaming because there are, again, way too many components involved. Maybe we can talk about, I think what I'd like to talk about is this. This is the, my last slide. So the copies is what I'm doing. Try to see how is that you can exchange buffers instead of copying data. The latency is one of the things that we had. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to the example of Skype. I think uh, the Tom Tom talking Tom would have to wait. So I'll talk about Skype because it involves latency, it involves performance, and it also involves integrating a new comfort. So latency because uh, Skype actually has a hard requirement on the latency. The latency is basically how much time you take from the camera. Say if you if this camera is taking a picture of mine, it's actually decoding and then playing back on a TV. So latency that we talk about is in glass to glass delay. We call it a glass to glass delay. So basically from this glass, which is the lens, to the other glass, which is the, uh, the TV there. So what is the latency that we have, uh, that we can achieve there? So ideally you'd be happy if, generally people don't notice if it's like 300 milliseconds times. It's okay, it's supposedly uh, okay. But we actually work on systems which needs 50 milliseconds latency. So you wanna achieve 50 millisecond latency, you have to go like really deep into the framework. So what you have to do for that is, your camera generally captures one frame in a second, right? No, oh, it's 30 frames in a second, but it's 30 frames. So the least you can go to is 33 milliseconds, right? You can't go below that. So what do you do? You basically split that frame into multiple uh, slices. So you don't get a frame completely, you, you take get portions of it. And then you, the encoder also, like if the platform supports like encoding that portions of the frame rather than the whole frame, you take that. And then similarly the decoder should also support it and the, your display should also support it. So that's how we go ahead and optimize it. And Another possibility is with respect to the buffering that's there. So if you see, uh, like the default configuration which might be there, might be having a lot of buffering internally. Or your codec configuration, your H264 has specific configuration called display delay. So your display delay is basically tells you like if there's a B frame, you would need so many buffers before which you can give a buffer out. So you'd have to understand the codec internals if you have, not about how to implement the codec or how to optimize the codec, but, but how the behavior of the codec is. Basically, read the codec uh, data sheet that comes along with it, and then see what how it behaves. So, if if you feel that at baseline, maybe we can at the baseline profile, if we can configure the codec so that the output buffers are not a lot, then your latency is going to come down. The other thing is uh, signaling errors. See, one of the issues that would, that we have with the current state of stage fright is the fact that there is a player pipeline and a recorder pipeline. What if I want to do something like a feedback pipe, right? Say based on like a bandwidth, that, say if you are doing a video conferencing, what you would like to have is a bandwidth adaptation <coughs> kind of a scenario where it actually adapts to the kind of bandwidth that's there in the system. So if you're making a video call, and if I'm making a video call from a phone on a 3G, the kind of bandwidth I have would be very different from what it would be have in an office, right? At office, you would, if you're seeing on a big screen, you'd want to have the best quality possible. But if you're doing it on, on a phone, you'd be happy if you could <coughs> see the video there. And you might not, it, because you're anyways looking at a, uh, on a small screen. So you would have to identify what's the bandwidth that's there, and then change the encoder bitrate, and then based on that, the decoder, uh, because the receiver pipe is the one that actually gets known how many frames are getting dropped, right? So based on that, it has to somehow signal to the other pipe, the, to the recorder pipe that yes, there are packet drops, there should be some mechanism of uh, reducing your sending uh, bitrate, because there seem to be a lot of packet drops in the in the network. So if, or if, there are, what if, because generally your radio, your 3G uh, data, there will also be errors. There could be errors too. So if there are errors, how is it that you recover from it, right? Because the decoder has options of recovering, but then how is it can signal to the encoder, add these, these, these tools. So it would be ideal if Stage had some kind of a framework for that, like some kind of signaling framework for that. 
Did you, uh, as part of your Skype uh, project, uh, implement any of that? Skype has uh, clients on all these platforms. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, did you did we implement what? As part of Skype, yeah. you would have run into this problem. Yeah. <coughs> Large screen. Yes. Screen. So what Skype actually is pretty easy for us because Skype actually takes care of understanding what the bandwidth is and telling us. If you are doing something on your own, if you want to do a, a video conferencing, a scalable video conferencing using SageFlight, it's going to be work. So, uh, related to the slice mode, uh, the latency per frame will still remain the same, right? Though you slice it, uh, do you want to like <coughs> move it? Latency will actually come down because, say, assume that your buffering is going to be four frames. Okay, so if you are if you are capturing at a frame per second, uh, the lowest denominator is going to be a frame. Then you are looking at 4 to 30, 30 milliseconds. If, you are, if your buffering is going to be 4 frames, and if your slices are going to be 1 fourth of it. So you are so saying basically your processing will happen in a batch. Is it what you are saying? No, my, my processing still happens in terms of uh, the slices. So yeah, if, I, if your encoder doesn't support slice mode, there's no point capturing in slice. No, I agree, but uh, I'm just yeah, wondering. Let's, let's take it up because I can show that it's actually lower. And the recording works in terms of pipe or uh, in terms of buffer? Because in buffers we fill the data and then pick the data. Yeah, in pipe we write data on uh, end and read from start. Actually, recording the data is passed around uh, with the buffers. Because while we are creating some application where network communication is there for suppose audio chat or video chat. Okay. Then we should get continuous data. Okay. If we create buffers, then picking data, it may give no. us delay. No, that's what we do. Internally, that's what hap finally happens. There is a pipeline, but there are uh, buffers being exchanged. That's how finally decoding happens. Okay. Then what about the latency between them? That's what we are supposed to pick, and that's why we get paid. <laughs> <laughs> so just a generic question. So Skype support started supporting video call on Android very recently, right? Yeah. So what took such a long time for Skype to start growing? What is that API support? Because actually, like we have comparison which says our performance is like. 16 times better than the Skype performance that's there. Because we are basically using the hardware better. Because if you, have, if you have write something that's generic, you can't actually be using the full capability of a hardware. Because at the top layer, if you're writing an application which you can install on, say, from your Nexus 1 to Nexus S to, yeah, from your single cores to dual cores to different, with different type of hardware, you, can't, you just can't use the hardware at the most optimal possible. So there are like umpteen number of uh, silicons that are there, there are umpteen number of Configuration there are there about the silicons. Just not possible to write an optimized code for everything. So even ours doesn't work well for uh, every silicon. One question is the Skype app is a pure app. Yes. You are talking about a lot of framework changes and all. Yeah. So ours is not downloadable into uh, any phone that's there. No, but Skype is downloadable to any phone. Yeah. But that's why they're not. Skype. That's the good thing. Skype is downloadable onto any phone. The bad thing is you won't be able to get the best possible uh, performance. <laughs> so if you, an example is on on an iPad, you have FaceTime and then you have Skype. You see the quality difference between FaceTime and Skype. On the, at the same bit rate, you'll actually have a much better performance and your battery is going to last much longer with FaceTime. We have tried that. Because FaceTime actually uses the hardware much closer. And Skype is not able to do it because Apple is just not interested in opening it up. This is a performance where you say 16x improvement, what is that performance? You're talking about decode and say, the, res the resolution that we can support. The resolution at the same performance level, right? What's your Skype decoder? We are able to do 720p 30 FPS, and the next step we are able to do 1080p 30. We have showcased it, so I think we should go on to something other than Skype. <laughs> so we can wrap up now. And anybody who has questions can you know, get in touch with Alexi later. So. Uh, it's, uh, it's there. It's on the first slide. It's galahad at gmail.com. So uh, I'm really uh, glad that Alex could take our time to have a session over here. Uh, big round of applause for the session. Uh,